I think I'm giving two talks this afternoon. This first one, I, I'm afraid it's going to be rather boring, but I, it's going to be about Anglican orders. But I was very pleased, there are four gentlemen today, so they're very interested in Anglican orders. So I didn't know, about, uh, I didn't think anyone here would be. Uh, when, I used to, when I used to teach in school as well, I always used to say to the children, what is the sacrament of orders? And they'd all put their hands up and they'd say, when it's, man is made a priest. And I used to say, no, it's when a man gets married. They'd say, no, no, it's when he's made a priest. I said, no, it's when a man gets married, because his wife orders him about for the rest of his life. Uh, but we're, we're going to talk about a really non-existent subject today, because Anglicans don't have any orders anyway. <laughs> so it's, 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 so it seems a bit silly talking about nothing for an hour. But the next talk uh, is about Carl and Newman, and it's much more interesting. Uh, now, in 1896, Pope Leo XIII, he issued a, a, a bull called Apostolicae Curae, in which he stated irrevocably that Anglican orders are invalid. Uh, that's the title I'm giving to this talk, is Anglican orders absolutely null and utterly void. And what that means is a layman who goes to an ordination ceremony in the Anglican Rite, at the end of the ceremony, he's still a layman. But then they go about uh, you know, dressing up in clerical clothes. We had, a, oh, it made me feel ill. We had the installation of the new Archbishop of Westminster, a man called Cormac Murphy O'Connor, and the name should tell you. <laughs> no, but I, I won't say anything prejudicial about Irish people because there might be some here. But uh, <laughs> there are, yes, yes, yes. And the big feature through his whole, the whole of his installation was his friend Archbishop George. That's this repellent man, uh, Dr. Carey, who's the so-called Archbishop of Canterbury. And he kept smiling, dear Archbishop George, and Archbishop George would smile back at him. And he you know, actually treated him as, as if he was an archbishop. And practically most of the Catholic bishops in the English-speaking world now, for all practical, practical purposes, they believe Anglican orders are valid and they want apostolic curie to be reversed which is why I'm talking about it, because you might say, well, what relevance has a bull published in 1896 to what's going on today? Well, it's, it's never been more relevant at all. And, uh, the, as I said, Leo XIII stated irrevocably that uh, Ang when Anglicans are ordained, uh, nothing, nothing happens. But to understand the meaning of the bull, Apostolic Curie, we've got to say a few words about the Reformation in England, uh, by which I talked some years, years ago. And as I told you, that Henry VIII, he wanted a new wife, and he wanted several new wives as time went on, but uh, he didn't want to have a new religion. And there's a, a, a Protestant historian, Professor Sage Williams, and he said, Henry VIII broke away from the Church of Rome, but the Church, of which he was the head after 1530, was not allowed to break away from Roman doctrine. And Catholic doctrine was enforced far more uh, severely in England than any of the, the, the Catholic countries in, in the continent of Europe. Where the liturgy was concerned, Henry VIII was particularly conservative. Uh, he kept the Latin Mass unchanged, and he, of course he kept the ordinal, the serum ordinal. Well, in those days, of course, it was called a pontifical. A pontifical is a book where all the ceremonies used by bishops are to be found. Ordinations and blessing churches, everything a bishop does is found in the pontifical. So, throughout the whole reign of uh, Henry VIII, the pontifical that had been used for hundreds of years was still being used. There was no problem whatsoever about the validity of orders. Well, Henry VIII wanted to have an Archbishop of Canterbury who would do whatever he wanted. So, he chose a fellow called Thomas Cranmer. And the Pope, Pope Clement VII, agreed to the appointment of, of Thomas Cranmer, uh, even though he knew really that Thomas Cranmer was a heretic, but he didn't want to upset uh, Henry. And Thomas Cranmer, you know, he really kept his beliefs very, very quiet in the reign of Henry VIII, because he, if he hadn't, he would have been burned at the stake. And he used to sit, Thomas Cranmer used to sit in his court, and he would condemn Protestants to be burned at the stake for believing exactly what he believed in, that uh, he, he wanted to survive. And uh, there, there's a man I'm going to talk about quite a lot when I give you my talk about new, a man called Horrell Frude. Uh, who is the main man responsible for the conversion of uh, Cardinal Newman. And he said the only good thing about Thomas Cranmer was that he burned well. <laughs> uh, because uh, he did get burned in the reign of Mary Tudor. And Cranmer, he'd been brought to Henry's attention. 
He, after he took the king's part in discussions they had in Cambridge about what was called the king's great matter, which was Henry VIII's divorce, which of course was really an annulment. And so Cranmer was consecrated as Archbishop of Canterbury on the 30th of March, and then he perjured himself because he took the oath of loyalty to the Pope, but, uh, which he didn't mean. But he claimed he hadn't committed perjury because before taking this oath, he took another oath so that he wouldn't mean the oath of loyalty to the, to the Pope. And when Cardinal Pole later said to him, he said, other men, you know, be want to, be want to perjure themselves after the event, but, but, but you did it before. So he was as obliging as Henry VIII had, had hoped. So as soon as he was consecrated, he obliged Henry VIII by he, declaring the marriage to Catherine of Aragon as invalid and the marriage to the pregnant Anne Boleyn as valid. Then later on, Henry wanted to marry Jane Seymour, so Cranmer declared that the marriage to Anne Boleyn was invalid. <laughs> And he'd never been married to her. And uh, then Jane Seymour died, giving birth to the future King Edward VI. And then Cranmer later officiated the wedding of Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves. And then Henry decided he didn't like Anne of Cleves, so Cranmer said, well, that one was invalid too. So he's put like the ideal Archbishop of Canterbury for Henry VIII. Well, in November 1534, Parliament passed the Act of Supremacy, declaring Henry to be the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England. So, to all intents and purposes, Henry was now both Pope and King. But, as I mentioned earlier, throughout his reign, they used the Serum Pontifical. So, all the ordinations done during his reign were valid. I'll just say a quick little word about the meaning of Serum, because a lot of you will have heard about the Serum Mass. Uh, it, it, it's not really a rite, it's called what's called a use. It was a, just a variation of the Roman rite. And it was the one most used in England before the Reformation. It was introduced by St. Osmond, who died in 1099, for his Diocese of Salisbury. And Serum is a corrupt abbreviation of the Latin Ceres Berea, which means Salisbury. Well, Henry VIII died in 1547, and he was succeeded by his nine-year-old son, Ed Edward, Edward VI, who I mix in to you as the, the son of his third wife, Jane Seymour. This poor little Edward, he was very, very ill and he was no more than a puppet of his council because he was too young to rule. So they set up a council, a king called the King's Council, to run the country for him. And the whole council was dominated by Protestants. There are some of them absolutely fanatical Protestants like Cranmer, who, and they proclaimed their new faith without any fear because there wasn't anything to fear from proclaiming it uh, once Henry VIII died. And Edward Seymour, who was the Duke of Somerset, he was the brother of James Seymour and the uncle of the king, and he became Edward's protector. And he was an absolutely fanatical Protestant. So he, Cranmer, and the other Protestants who dominated the king's council, they had just one aim, and it was to obliterate Catholicism from the face of the land. Uh, Cran and the, particularly the mass, Thomas Cranmer hated the mass as, it was a, as if it was a living person. And so he wanted to destroy the Mass by bringing in new uh, services for, com uh, for communion, uh, which he brought one in in 1549. And what they did, there was nothing in it that specifically rejected Catholic teaching on the Mass, but he cut out nearly all the prayers and ceremonies that could be interpreted as believing in sacrifice or the real presence. And then the next year, 1550, he brought in a new ordinal, a new rite for ordination, and abolished the, the Serum Pontifical, now, the introduction of Cranmer's ordinal was certainly the most important event in the English Reformation, and a factor of considerable significance regarding the new ordinal lies in the fact that Cranmer invited a man called Martin Bucer to come to England during the summer of 1549. Martin Bucer, who lived from 1491 to 1551, he was the most influential of all the German reformers after Luther and Melanchthon. He'd been a Dominican, but he was excommunicated by the Bishop of Speer for preaching Lutheranism in Alsace in 1523. And after the death of Zwingli, Bucer became the leader of the Reformed churches in Switzerland and South Germany. And he married twice. His first wife was a former nun. And his second wife, she was the widow of three other Protestant reformers, all of whom had died after getting married to her. And she also survived Bucer. <laughs> <laughs> she must have been some woman, but uh, anyway, uh, Bucer, he was held in the very highest esteem by Thomas Cranmer, who had him appointed Regis Professor of Divinity in Cambridge University, 
and he exercised a very, very great influence upon the 1550 ordinal. All this is very, very relevant to what I'm going to tell you about apostolic curate, because Pope Leo XIII took all this into consideration. He took Cranmer's communion service into consideration and the part played by Bucer and other Protestant reformers. Uh, and among the books which Bucer brought with him to England was uh, one on ordination. It was called De, De Ordinatione Legitima. And Cardinal's uh, uh, is legitimate ordination, which, of course, is uh, sort of typical Protestant uh, misstatement because the, his, these ordinations were completely illegitimate. But let's leave that aside. And Cranmer's ordinal, it was inspired all the way through by Bucer's ideas. And to a large extent, it just paraphrases the, this Lutheran ordinal of Bucer. Now, during this talk, several times I'm going to use the term sacramental signification. And so I'd better explain the term before I begin. There just might be one or two people not familiar with it. Uh, well, it hardly needs saying that every sign signifies something. If you happen to be passing Buckingham Palace and you see the royal standard fluttering majestically in the breeze, uh, does anyone know what that means? That means the Queen is in residence, yes. And if you see the bare flagpole, that signifies that the Queen is not in residence. So, well, the, the Catechism of the Council of Trent had nothing to do with the royal standard on Buckingham Palace, but uh, it, it did teach, following St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, that the sacraments are sacred signs. But in contrast with all other signs, the sacraments bring about what they signify, which, of course... For example, the Queen's standard doesn't a sign like that. If you put the Queen's standard up on the flagpole and she wasn't there, she wouldn't suddenly miraculously appear in Buckingham Palace. But the difference with the sacraments is whatever they signify, they actually bring it about. And they can be defined in the catechism definition, a lot of you will know, as outward signs of inward grace ordained by Jesus Christ. The outward sign, obviously, is something that can be discerned by the senses. And is therefore called a sensible sign. And the sensible aspect of the sacrament, what you can see, what you can hear, what is done, it's only one sign, but it has two parts, which you, you all know, the matter and the form. So in order to bring a sacrament to completion, you need a, a, a third element, and that's the minister of the sacrament who affects it. And to use the technical term, the minister of a sacrament has to intend to do what the church does. All three things are essential, and if any one is, of them is lacking, the sacrament is not affected. All these points can be illustrated by the sacrament of the Eucharist. The minister must be a validly ordained priest. The sign is the bread which he holds in his hands. The matter, that's the bread is the matter, and the form, the words that he speaks. So when the priest holds the bread in his hand, and you see the bread and you hear him say, this is my body, the bread is transformed into the true body of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So the sacramental sign, what you've seen and what you've heard, has brought about what it signifies. Now, in the Serum Pontifical, the ordaining bishop handed a chalice and a paten to the ordinand, saying, Receive the power to offer sacrifice to God and to celebrate Mass, both for the living and the dead, in the name of the Lord. Uh, on Thursday, I had the great privilege of being present at the uh, ordination of an English seminarian who was here last year, William Hudson, and uh, I was particularly struck by this lovely ceremony when they handed over the, uh, the, the chalice and the pattern. So I'll repeat those words again. They hand a chalice and a pattern to the new, uh, the man who's going to be ordained and say, receive the power to offer a sacrifice to God and to celebrate Mass both for the living and the dead in the name of the Lord. Now among the many changes made in, for Cranner's ordinal, was the replacement of these words which I've just uh, told you. In Cranmer's Ordinal it says, Take thou the authority to preach the word of God and to minister the holy sacraments in this congregation where thou shalt be so appointed. And a Bible was handed to the ordinand at the same time as the chalice and pattern. So the sacramental signification of this ceremony was thus reduced to giving authority to preach and administer the sacraments and not the power to offer sacrifice. Well, people like Bucer thought even this ordinal wasn't Protestant enough. They thought it was still too Catholic. So in 1552, a new version appeared, and the principal difference in this new version 
was the ceremony for the delivery of the chalice and the pattern was removed completely. And this made it absolutely clear that what was taking place was the ordination of a minister of the word and sacraments and definitely not a sacrificing priest. And a new version of the communion service was published in the same year in which any words or actions which could be interpreted as indicating belief in the sacrifice or real presence were completely eliminated. And this was largely in response to complaints made about the 1549 service by Martin Bucer. Uh, for example, Martin Bucer objected to communion being placed on the tongue of the communicant, which was the case in, in the Cranus 1549 communion service. And he wanted this change for two reasons. He said, if the bread is placed on the tongue of the communicant, it gives the impression that the bread he is receiving is not just ordinary bread, such as you eat at the table, and that the man who gives the communion is not the same as an ordinary man, that he has some sort of special powers, which, of course, Catholics believe uh, that a priest has. And they also had a rubric in this 1552 uh, communion service saying any bread that was left over, that any of this consecrated bread that was left over, the uh, minister had to t- could take it home and eat it you know, with his family meal, just to make it absolutely clear they believe that, n- that, that nothing happened. Uh, now, for Thomas Cranmer and Bucer and Luther, ordination, as I said, it signified no more than an appointment to a position within the church of greater ranks here than being a church warden, but it was devoid of any priestly character. Luther denied there was a sacram- any sacrament of order. He, he said the only priesthood is the universal priesthood of all the faithful. So anyone would have the ability to celebrate the Eucharist. But in, order, you know, for, in the interest of good order, you had to have someone appointed. You couldn't all gather for your communion service and everyone rush up to the you know, table and want to be the one who celebrated it. But that, that's all it was, just an appointment to, to perform a function. Uh, so, Cranmer's two ordinals, as well as having totally mu- mutilated the traditional ordinal, taking out, taking out all the prayers and ceremonies, which made it clear that a priest was being ordained to offer the sacrifice of the Mass, you also have to take into consideration Cranmer's communion services, and they were mutilated. Every prayer and every ceremony that could possibly indicate that uh, a sacrifice was being offered or our Lord was made truly present were removed when he revised his service in 1552. Now, Cranmer's two ordinals, they were in use for about four years, and they were utilised for the ordination of a good number of priests and the consecration of six bishops. In 1553, this rather pathetic little boy, King Edward, died, and the Catholic Mary Tudor, who was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and had stood up for her Catholic faith absolutely heroically, in the, during the reign of her father and during the reign of Edward VI. She insisted on having a priest and having mass every day. And she became queen. And uh, don't mix her up, by the way, with Mary, Queen of Scots. They're nothing to do with each other. Mary Tudor, who of course is called Bloody Mary, uh, because history was written by the Protestants. And Elizabeth is called Good Queen Bess, and anyone less good than her, it'd be hard to imagine. Uh, but... Uh, so whenever you have a Bloody Mary, drink a little toast to Mary Tudor with it. Well, she, was, she, she came to the throne, and to, to the very, very great joy, of, and, and this isn't an exaggeration, 99% of the people of England and Wales were still Catholic at heart, and they welcomed her uh, coronation with great joy. And a well-known Protestant uh, historian, Professor S.T. Bindoff, he writes, soon after Mary's accession to the throne, the Mass was being celebrated in London churches not by commandment, but of the people's devotion. And news was coming in of its unopposed uh, revival throughout the country. Catholicism flourished once again. Altars, images, crucifixes and candlesticks were restored to the churches with alacrity. And in parish churches, the damage done by the Reformation was repaired. And clerical recruitment boomed again for the first time since the 1520s. You see, during the reign of Edward VI, nobody wanted to become a priest because they knew they weren't becoming priests. But then a huge number of vacations came forward in, in, in the reign of Mary Tudor. And in despair, Protestant writers in exile called for rebellion to overturn Mary's regime before the reconstruction of Catholicism became irreversible. When Queen Mary had succeeded in effecting a reconciliation with Rome, 
the Pope appointed Cardinal Pole as his legate. And among the many problems facing the Cardinal Legate was the problem of the priestly ordinations and episcopal consecrations which had taken place during the schism. So all the clergy in England could be put in one of three categories. There were those who had been ordained before the schism. There were those who who were ordained during the schism, but according to the Serum Pontifical. And there were those who were ordained during the schism according to Cranmer's new ordinals. So, with regard to the first and second class, their ordination was certainly valid, and all that was necessary was that they should be absolved from the guilt of schism and given the church's authority to use the orders they received. So, although the bishops they ordained during the reign of Henry VIII were schismatic, and they took no oath of loyalty to the Pope, they had the correct Catholic right of ordination, so they were definitely bishops. Now, as I've said, if... uh, Queen Mary allowed quite a few of them to carry on, people like Bonner, who became the Bishop Bishop of London, and Gardner, who became her Lord Chancellor. And uh, all they had to do is be absolved from schism. But uh, with the third category, those ordained with Cranmer's ordinal, there was obviously a problem. They'd been ordained by a rite which had not been approved by the Church, and their status was a matter of considerable doubt. There are a number of possibilities. Some are quite technical and complex as to what precisely the status might be. The three most likely possibilities were, one, Cranmer's ordinations could be accepted as valid and satisfactory. Two, they could be accepted as of dubious validity and necessitate what's called conditional reordination. Thirdly, they could be invalid and require unconditional ordination for those who'd receive them should the church allow them to be ordained. So Cardinal Pole asked for for guidance from Rome before he made his decision. And the matter was entrusted to a man, Thomas Thurlby, who was the Bishop of Ely. If you ever go to England, visit Ely Cathedral. Has anyone ever been there? there yes, there are 5,000 statues and bas reliefs there, and everyone has had their head smashed off. It just shows you the hatred uh, of Protestantism for, 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 for anything to do with the Catholic religion. But anyway, Thomas Thurlby was the Bishop of Ely, and he left for Rome in February 1555. Now, he had been consecrated with the rites of the Serum Pontifical during the reign of Henry VIII. So he'd been, he he was a systematic but validly consecrated bishop. And he had a full knowledge of what took place during the reign of Henry VIII and what took place during the reign of Edward VI. And he actually, he had made a public protest in the House of Lords against uh, Thomas Cranmer's ordinal. He he objected to it, 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 it being used. So he took all the relevant documents with him, including a Latin translation of all the essential parts of the Anglican ordinal. And these documents can still be found in the Vatican archives. You can see them today. On the 20th of June, 1555, Pope Paul IV issued a bull called Triclara Carissimi, in which he ruled that those who have been promoted to ecclesiastical orders by anyone but a bishop validly and lawfully ordained are bound to receive these orders again. But as I'm sure all, all uh, the, the, the priests here will have noted, this is rather ambiguous. And so Cardinal Pole asked for further clarification, because it didn't quite make clear you know, what was the position of the ordinal. So the Pope issued an explanatory brief on the 3rd of October 1555. And this brief explained that the intention of the bull had been to rule that, and I quote, it is only those bishops and archbishops who are not ordained and consecrated in the form of the church that can be said not to be duly and rightly ordained. And therefore the persons promoted by them to these orders have not received orders, but ought and are bound to receive anew the said orders from their ordinary, that's the bishop, according to the tenor and content of our aforesaid letters. So this clarification is absolutely unambiguous. Nobody who'd been ordained with Cranmer's ordinals was a priest or, or a bishop. And the brief also explained that those who'd been ordained or consecrated, according to the Serum Pontifical, they had received valid orders and could use them when they'd got a dispensation from the legate. And this was even someone, say, who'd been consecrated by Thomas Cranmer, who didn't believe in the priesthood, but if he'd used the Catholic Pontifical... Uh, the, the, the orders were, st- were still valid. But there was not a single case of anyone who'd been ordained using Cranmer's ordinal ever having been recognised as having valid orders. Quite a few of the ones who'd been ordained priests 
uh, had to be reordained so that they could exercise their priesthood. And uh, there are records, actually, of only 16, but in Episcopal registers, you can look them up and see the names and dates of 16 uh, ministers ordained under Tom, with Thomas Cranner's ordinal who were unconditionally uh, reordained using the Serum Pontifical. And there isn't a single instance produced of a cleric who received uh, Cranner's or, or orders using Cranner's ordinal. It's called some as the Edwardian orders. If you hear me use the word Edwardian, it means in the reign of Edward VI. There isn't one case of anyone ordained with the Edwardian ordinal being authorized to continue his, mystery, his ministry without reordination. Commenting on these facts, Dr. Francis Clark, who's the outstanding contemporary Catholic authority on Anglican orders, he remarks, the old plea that Anglican orders were not set aside as invalid in Mary's reign had its vogue in the 19th century before the documents that discredited it were brought to light. But it is strange that it should still linger on today because there's still Anglican clerics there who claim that, uh, they, they, that, that Cranner's ordinals, uh, uh, that orders conferred using Cranner's ordinals had never been condemned as invalid, which is completely crazy. The attitude of contemporary Catholics to the validity of orders conferred by the Anglican ordinal was made very clear in a sermon preached by Bishop Bonner in 1555, in which he refers to the late made ministers in the time of the schism in their new devised ordination, having no authority at all given to them to offer in the Mass the body and blood of our Saviour Christ. Now, Bonner was the most courageous of the Catholic-minded bishops during the reign of Edward VI. He'd become a schismatic under Henry VIII, but he drew the line when they started abolishing the Mass and, and introducing the, the, these new ordinals, and he just refused to accept any of that, and he was, he was put into prison for it. Uh, like Bishop Garner, he was restored to his see under Queen Mary, and among his homilies, some of which have been published, the, the extract that I've just... Uh, read to you is of very, very great importance because it proves that contemporary Catholics had not the least doubt that the Edwardian ordinal was invalid in both its 1550 and 1552 forms. And I'm going to read you a longer extract from this sermon uh, because it's an antidote to all these liberal ecumenical post-Vatican II uh, clergy, particularly bishops, who keep wanting to say that you know, Anglican orders are valid and that nobody said they were invalid at the time. Bishop Bonner knew exactly what the Reformation was about because he lived right through it, and then he suffered for his Catholic beliefs. This is what he says in, in this sermon. Priests, being among other things called the ministration of the sacraments, and the chiefest and most precious of all sacraments being the sacrament of the altar, in ministration whereof the priest ought both to consecrate and to offer, Therefore, the late made ministers in the time of the schism, in their new devised ordination, having no authority at all given to them to offer in the Mass the body and blood of our Saviour Christ, but both they so ordered, or rather disordered, and their schismatical orders also, utterly despising and impugning not only the oblation or sacrifice of the Mass, but also the real presence of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ in the sacrament of the altar, Therefore I say that all such both damnably and presumptuously to defend against Almighty God and also must pitifully beguile the people of the realm who by this means were defrauded of the most blessed body and blood of our Saviour Christ and the most comfortable fruit thereof and also of the sacrifice of the Mass and of the inestimable fruit that cometh thereby and seeing that every man be he never so simple may sufficiently hereby perceive how these late counterfeited ministers have in so weighty a manner deceived the people concerning eternal salvation and greatly abused them and brought them to a most lamentable state, you may thereby consider both what thanks you owe to Almighty God who hath restored unto you the right use of the sacraments again and also how much you ought to esteem the right priesthood now brought home again by which as an ordinary means God worketh his grace among you. So, as you said, because of Cranner's ordinals, there were no validly ordained priests or bishops, so the people didn't have a, uh, a valid Holy Communion, and there was no sacrifice, and there was no real presence. Pope Leo XIII delivered the final judgment on Anglican orders in his Bull Apostolicae Curae. 
What was it that prompted him to promulgate this bull in 1896? Contrary to widespread opinion today, he was not motivated by any animosity towards the Church of England. In fact, it was completely the opposite. The Pope had been convinced by an ecumenically minded French priest, the Abbe Fernand Portal, that the Church of England was Catholic in all but communion with Rome. So he gave the Pope the impression it was like it was in the reign of Henry VIII. And everything in the Church of England was Catholic, they just didn't recognise the Pope. And uh, he also said there was a great desire for reunion among Anglicans. Uh, the reason this had happened was he'd been on holiday in the island of Madeira in 1899. What a priest was doing on holiday in the island of Madeira in 1899, one when, when, when wonders. In 1889, sorry. And he met, met by chance Lord Halifax, who was a leader of the Anglo-Catholic movement. And had it not been for this meeting, the Bull Apostolic Cure would never have been written. The Abbey was astonished by the picture of the Church of England conveyed to him by Lord Halifax. And he eventually came to England as the, the, the guest of Lord Halifax. And he was taken to visit Anglo-Catholic parishes, convents and shrines. But he was protected by very careful screening from cat contact with the militantly anti-Catholic evangelical Anglicans, who are about a 70 or 80 percent majority in the Church of England, who just wouldn't want to be priests. They don't believe they are priests, they don't believe there's any real presence, they don't believe there's any sacrifice. And as I said, there are at least 80 percent, even today, of the Anglican clergy. But Lord Halifax kept the Abbey Portal away from these people, and incredible as it may seem, he wouldn't even allow him to meet any English Catholics. He was invited by Cardinal Vaughan to lunch, and he turned him down. He said he was too busy to go. But uh, he did have, uh, he had time to go and visit the Archbishop of Canterbury. Lord Halifax admitted as well, he said it would have been impossible to find a Pope who was more sympathetically disposed to the Church of England than Pope Leo XIII. In a public speech, Lord Halifax said, Oh, if only English churchmen could see, see Leo XIII. They could only know what he is and how much depends upon him. They would realize that there is no prayer they should make with greater earnestness than that it should please Almighty God to prolong his days. We can never hope to see a Pope more ready and anxious to take generous steps with regard to the English Church. Now, word reached Cardinal Vaughan that such as the Pope's enthusiasm at the prospect of bringing the Church of England back into Catholic unity he was on the point of, of, of writing a letter to the Archbishops of Canterbury and York. And he was also going to agree to have uh, only conditional ordination for any Anglican clergy who, who, who became Catholics. And Cardinal Vaughan was horrified by this. So he went straight to Rome to see the Pope and they told him, he said, you just absolutely can't do this. Uh, Cardinal Vaughan, by the way, he was descended from an old English Catholic family and they had 15 children Seven of the boys became priests, and all six of the girls entered uh, convents. I mean, you wouldn't even find a family with 16 children today, would you? Uh, but anyway, he, 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 as I said, he had the courage to go to Rome and, and tell the Pope openly that you just, you just absolutely can't do this. And Pope Leo had the humility to listen to Cardinal Vaughan and follow his advice that he must set up a commission to examine the question of Anglican orders. But his goodwill, the goodwill of the Pope towards the Church of England, is made by the, clear by the lengths to which he went to make sure that the examination of Anglican orders was carried out in accordance with the strictest standards of scholarship and impartiality. So all the Anglicans today, and a lot of their Catholic uh, apologists, say it was totally biased, only one side was heard. Well, as I'm going to show you now, this is completely untrue. Uh, they set up a commission of scholars who were specially chosen for their learning on the matter of orders and Anglican orders, and it was convened with a mandate to conduct the most thorough possible investigation. The original six members were divided equally between theologians who accepted the validity of Anglican orders and those who denied the validity. I'd better tell you at this point, the documents that I read to you, the, 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 the bull and the brief condemning uh, the... Cranmer's ordinals, had been lost. Nobody knew about them at the time. They were found by Cardinal Gasquet during the course of this commission. So it was possible to hold that Anglican orders could be uh, valid. So the three pro, so that you've got three pro-validity Catholic theologians, three anti-validity Catholic theologians, and the 
three pro-validity members were assisted throughout the discussions by two Anglican theologians, the Reverend J. Lacey and the Reverend F. W. Pullen, and they remained in Rome throughout all the sittings of the Commission with the approval of Cardinal Rampola, who is the Vatican Secretary of State, and the Anglican Archbishop of York. Mr. Lacey, but I'm not being rude calling these Anglican clergymen Mr. Lacey, the, the correct title for an Anglican clergyman is Mr. You, w- you wouldn't call him Reverend Lacey. You could say that the Reverend J.A. Lacey, or whatever his name was, but the, you, the correct title for vicars, if you read Troll for anybody, is Mr. Uh, so, uh, they used to call Catholic priests Mr. at that time, by the way. Uh, anyway, the... the so they had three pro-validity theologians, these two Anglican clergy advising them, and uh, then they appointed uh, some more theologians. Uh, the Abbe Duchesne, Monsignor Gasper, and Father de Augustinus were all appointed later after submitting pro-validity memoranda to the Pope, which proves that Leo XIII was determined to have an absolutely impartial inquiry. And the pro-invalidity scholars, the ones who said Anglican orders were invalid, they were Father F.A. Gasquet, who later became Cardinal Gasquet, the famous historian. Uh, he was a Benedictine. Canon J.C. Moyes and a Father D. Uh, D. Fleming, who was a Franciscan. Uh, Father J.B. Scannell, who was, Scannell, who was one of the very few English priests who thought Anglican orders were valid, he joined the first group. And Father de Flen Evaras, who was a Spanish Capuchin, was added to the second. Now, Mr. Lacey accepted that the relationship of the Anglican theologians to their sympathizers on the commission could be compared to that of a solicitor, solicitor to a counsel. He was brief. Uh, you know, in English courts, we don't have lawyers just... Uh, I think an American lawyer can do anything. I hear many of them do, but... Uh, sorry. Uh, but in Britain, we have lawyers called barristers. They're the ones who appear in court and wear the wigs. And solicitors are the people you go to and you say whatever you want to do if you want to sue somebody. And then they'll draw up a state of the case and then they'll commission a barrister to present it in court. So these Anglican clergymen acted as if they were solicitors and the Catholic theologians who believed in the validity of Anglican orders, they were like the, the, the barristers. Uh, now the, cities of the, the sittings of the commission extended over six weeks and what is absolutely certain was that no argument favourable to the validity of Anglican orders was overlooked because as I said, these two Anglican clerics were helping all the time. Uh, and every possible validity was given to these Anglicans and the pro-validity theologians to examine any documents in the Vatican or in the Holy Office, many of which were still unknown or or unpublished in England. And it was during these investigations that Father Gasquet, later to become Cardinal Gasquet, found the bull and brief issued during the reign of Mary Tudor condemning uh, Anglican orders as invalid at that time. Uh, they, They, on... The 7th of May, 1896, the Commission held its last meeting and all its findings were were written down and they were given to a commission of cardinals to examine the evidence. And the cardinals met to reach their decision on the solemnity of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Thursday the 16th of July, with the Holy Father himself presiding, which showed how seriously he took the matter. And at these meetings, the cardinals were absolutely unanimous in their condemnation of Anglican orders as invalid. There was not one who, after going through all the evidence, was not convinced of invalidity. Now, as I've made clear, they weren't... They didn't set up the commission with the object of condemning them as invalid. It would have been wonderful if they could have found them as valid, because it might have helped to bring the Anglican Church back into unity with the Holy See. But they examined the evidence objectively, and... uh, every cardinal pronounced that Anglican orders were invalid. But of course the Pope, as you know, he has absolute authority in the church, and he was under no obligation to endorse the decision of the cardinals. He didn't even have to issue a pronouncement upon Anglican orders. So, and these were the days when popes were really popes. So for nine days, he, he made a novena. It's an appropriate period for a novena, I suppose. He, he made a novena to the Holy Ghost for nine days, asking for special help and enlightenment in making his own decision. And he offered his Mass every day for the intention that he might do what was best for the Church of God in putting forth or withholding a decision on the subject of Anglican orders. Then, at the end of the Novena, suddenly everything seemed to become clear to him. And uh, 
He published the bull Apostolici Curie on Friday the 18th of September 1896 and it pronounced finally and irrevocably that Anglican orders have been and are absolutely null and utterly void. In his classic work, Eucharistic Sacrifice and the Reformation, anyone who is actually into Eucharistic theology, that's a book you should get. Eucharistic Sacrifice and the Reformation by Dr. Francis Clark. And this is how he explains the ball. In the Bull Apostolic Curia of 1896, pronouncing Anglican orders invalid, Pope Leo XIII singled out one factor as vital. On it, his central argument depends. It is the native character and spirit of the ordinal, the anti-sacerdotal and anti-sacrificial connotation, which, he declared, the new rite acquired from the circumstances of its origin, and which rendered its wording incapable of serving as a sacramental form for ordination. Now you can see how I was telling you about Crenna's communion service, because you, that was taken into consideration. The fact he removed every prayer uh, indicating that, the, that his communion service could be a sacrifice, the fact that he brought Bucer over and other people, all these showed that, that their intention was not to have a rite of ordination that could ordain sacrificing priests. Pope Leo noted the manner in which the Anglican reformers brought their new ordinal into line with the Protestant heresy. Now I'm quoting from uh, Apostolic A. Curie. For the full and accurate understanding of the Anglican ordinal, besides what we have noted as to some of its parts, there is nothing more pertinent than to consider carefully the circumstances under which it was composed and publicly authorised. It would be tedious to enter into details, nor is it necessary to do so, as the history of that time is sufficiently eloquent as to the animus of the authors of the ordinal against the Catholic Church, as to the abettors whom they associated with themselves from the heterodox sects, and as to the end they had in view, being fully cognizant of the necessary connection between faith and worship, between the law of believing and the law of praying, under a pretext of returning to primitive form, they corrupted the liturgical order in many ways to suit the errors of the reformers. For this reason, in the whole ordinal, not only is there no clear mention of the sacrifice uh, of the mass, of the consecration of the priesthood, the sacerdotium, and of the power of consecrating and offering sacrifice, but, as we have just stated, every trace of these things which had been in such prayers of the Catholic rite as they had not entirely rejected, was deliberately removed and struck out. Some Anglicans have protested that this passage is unjust because the word priest occurs throughout the Anglican ordinal. But the essence of the Catholic priesthood can only be defined with reference to its primary function of offering sacrifice. It's a very pleasant coincidence that Father Brayer was talking about all this in his homily today. A Catholic priest is a sacrificing priest he is a man who is ordained, as the traditional ordination rite expressed it, to offer sacrifice to God and to celebrate Mass both for the living and the dead. To use the term priest when referring to a priesthood vitiated in its essential character has about as much meaning as the use of the word democratic was in all the communist countries. When they're all, like in Germany, you have the Democratic Republic of Germany, which was the undemocratic part. Uh, and so the word democratic was meaningless in this context. To use, so to use the word priest uh, in reference to uh, a Protestant denomination that clearly rejected the priest and the sacrifice of the masses is just completely meaningless. And the thing is, most Anglicans would agree with this because, as I said to you earlier, they don't want to be sacrificing priests. The Reverend G. Lamp, who is Ely Professor of Divinity in the University of Cambridge, he writes that loyal Anglicans should be thankful that their orders are not valid in the sense of Catholic theology. Another Anglican, the Reverend T. H. L. Parker, is equally forthright. Criticising attempts by Anglo-Catholics to prove that Cranmer's ordinal was not a totally Protestant rite, he comments, and this is the Protestant saying this, but the plain fact about the Edwardian ordinal was its Protestant character. It was a Reformation rite springing out of and expressing a Protestant concept of church and ministry. No doubt the debate will continue. Loopholes will still be found. New versions of old arg arguments brought forward. But all this cannot really hide the fact that Anglo-Catholics are in a most unenviable dilemma. It is true that the Anglican ordinal, like Cranus 1549 communion service, did not specifically exclude or deny the Catholic concept of the priesthood. 
But as Pope Leo makes clear, the key to the understanding of Anglican orders lies in an accurate appreciation of the historical setting in which the order was composed. Uh, I'll just quote a little passage again that I've already given. The history of that time is sufficiently eloquent as to the animus of the authors of the ordinal against the Catholic Church, as to the abettors whom they associated with themselves from the heterodox sects, and as to the end they had in view. In a reiteration of traditional teaching regarding the substance of a sacrament, Pope Leo explains that the matter in itself can be indeterminate. And I'm quoting from Apostolic Curie now. The imposition of hands, which indeed by itself signifies nothing definite and is equally used for several orders and, and for confirmation. So the, the Pope says the sacramental signification pertains chiefly to the form, where the operative words of the form do not specify the grace and power of a sacrament this can be determined by prayers in other parts of the rite, namely by what is known as the determinatio exigentis. Uh, what this means, for example, even, even in the traditional Catholic rite of ordination, the actual form, the words the priest, the bishop says when he places his hand on the head of the ordinand, they don't make it clear that he's ordaining a sacrificing priest, but prayers in the other parts of the ordinal do. And the fact that the priest is going to celebrate the sacrifice of the Mass, that, that makes it uh, clear that they're intending to ordain a sacrificing priest. Of course, the illogical name for this is determinatio ex adjunctis. So, even though the wording of a form for the sacrament of ordination in many rites may not in itself make it clear what the rite is intended to do, that wording, that technical expression for that would be that the wording... Uh, is is, uh, not sufficiently determinate in itself. I apologise for using all these technical uh, terms. Uh, That means it doesn't make clear what the rites intended to do. So it gets a signification or determination from other prayers and actions of the rite, or even from the connotation of the ceremony as a whole in the religious context of the age. Thus, the reform found in both the Edwardian ordinals must be considered in the context of the fact that there are no prayers or ceremonies anywhere in either of these ordinals indicating that its purpose is to ordain a sacrificing priest. And the fact that the Anglican Communion Service has also been denuded of all such sacrificial prayers and ceremonies, which are found in the Catholic Mass, or used to be found in the Catholic Mass, uh, and also you have to take into consideration the articles of the Church of England. There are the 42 articles of 1533, and the 39 Articles of 1563. Article 31 of the uh, Anglican Articles says this, The sacrifices of masses in, in the which it was commonly said that the priest did offer Christ for the quick and the dead to have remission of pain or guilt were blasphemous fables and dangerous deceits. And that's still the teaching of the Church of England today. Every Anglican cleric who's ordained has to swear to uphold the 39 articles in the exact liter- the, their exact literal meaning. Uh, but it's amazing that it's Anglo-Catholics especially, they, that they try and explain away the meaning of Article 31, and they say it's not against the sacrifice of the Mass at all. And the most celebrated Anglican to do this was, was Cardinal Newman. Uh, and he, may, he tried to explain Article 31 in a Catholic way in his famous Tract 90, about which I'll be talking to you at my second talk this afternoon, which will be much more interesting than this one. But a man of his scholarship and integrity was incapable of maintaining such an untenable position, and in the end, Newman said, he accepted, he said, I do not see how it can be denied that this article caused the sacrifice of the Mass itself in all its daily celebration from year's end to year's end, a blasphemous fable. As regards the real presence, the Anglican 28, Article 28 states, and I'd like you to listen to this very carefully, transubstantiation or the change of the substance of bread and wine in a supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of the scripture, overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper, only after a heavenly and spiritual manner. And the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not, by Christ's ordinance, reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. 
Well, and that's still an article of the Anglican religion today, and you can't get away from its obvious meaning. And the final sentence, which I'll repeat, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up a worship. That was a deliberate uh, repudiation of the teaching of the Council of Trent. Canon 6 of the teaching of, Council, of the Council of Trent on the Eucharist reads as follows. If anyone says that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored in the sacrament of the Eucharist for the worship of Latria, including external worship, and that the sacrament, therefore, is not to be honoured with extraordinary festive celebrations, nor solemnly carried from place to place in processions, according to the praiseworthy universal right and custom of the Holy Church, or that the sacrament is not to be publicly exposed for the people's adoration, and that those who adore it are idolaters, let him be anathema. As I've just shown you, the Anglicans specifically put in words, repudiating this canon. By examining the Anglican ordinal in itself, and in the context of its exadjunctive setting, Pope Leo was, be, was able to prove beyond any possible doubt that the Anglican rite was not intended to ordain sacrificing priests. Its signification points in the very opposite direction. The Pope's chief proof of this was contained in the following paragraph. In vain has help been recently sought for the plea of the validity of Anglican orders from other prayers of the same ordinal. For to put aside other reasons which show this to be insufficient for the purpose of the Anglican rite, let this argument suffice for all. From them has been deliberately removed whatever sets forth the dignity and office of the priesthood in the Catholic rite. That form consequently cannot be considered apt or sufficient for the sacrament which omits what it ought essentially to signify. Dr. Clark has summarised the essence of this argument of the Pope as follows. A sacrament of the Catholic Church is a sacred sign by which divine power is made an effective instrument for bestowing God's gifts and grace upon men. Since the outward sacrament is essentially a sign, it must signify, I repeat that, it must signify what it affects inwardly. For the sacrament of holy orders, therefore, every valid ordination rite must in some way explicitly or implicitly signify the bestowal of the Catholic sacerdotal office. But the Anglican ordination rite has never signified this since by its very origin it was stamped with an anti-sacerdotal signif significance. Uh, significance here is, is what the rite is intended to affect, and it's sometimes referred to as the intention of the rite. But Dr. Clark doesn't like the term intention of the rite, because it could be confused with the, what's called ministerial intention, the intention of the minister who, who, who's celebrating the rite or administering the sacrament. The Pope declared Anglican orders to be invalid for two reasons. The Anglican ordinal is defective in form, that's sacramental signification, and the ministerial intention of those who first used it was defective. Where the term defective intention is used, the Pope is referring to a defective ministerial intention. He's not referring to any uh, defect in the intention of the right, because the right actually can't have an intention. So what he's saying, the Anglican bishops who used this uh, uh, ordinal had no intention of conferring the Catholic priesthood upon the, the man they ordained, ordained with it. Uh, Pope Leo explained the position as follows with this inherent defect of form is joined the defect of intention which is equally essential to the sacrament the church does not judge about the mind and intention in so far as it is something by its nature internal so where I mentioned to you earlier people like Thomas Cranner who didn't believe in the priest of the mass ordained people in Henry VIII's reign using the serum pontifical and it's just presumed those were valid because you can't look into a man's mind and say what he intends to do. But, but the Pope says, insofar as it is manifested externally, she's bound to judge concerning it. A person who has correctly and seriously used the requisite matter and form to effect and confer a sacrament is presumed for that very reason to have intended to do what the Church does. So when these uh, heretical bishops in the reign of Henry VIII you use uh, ordain somebody, because they use the Catholic rite, they're presumed to have intended to do what the church does. On this principle rests the doctrine that a sacrament is truly conferred by the ministry of one who is a heretic or unbaptized, provided the Catholic rite be employed. You know, of course, an unbaptized person can administer the sacrament of baptism. Uh, 
or someone a Jew uh, 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 or an atheist can validly baptize someone. So, to go back to Leo XIII, he said, on this principle rests the doctrine that a sacrament is truly conferred by the ministry of one who is a heretic or unbaptized, and here's the key point, providing the Catholic rite be employed. On the other hand, if a rite be changed with the manifest intention of introducing another rite not approved by the Church, and of rejecting what the Church does, and what, by the institution of Christ, belongs to the nature of the sacrament, then it is clear that not only is the necessary intention wanting to the sacrament, but that the intention is adverse to and destructive of the sacrament. So what the Pope is saying here, when heretics use the traditional ordination rite, you can't look into their minds, you presume it's valid. But when they concoct a new rite from which everything truly relating to the priesthood has been removed, then you can say they did not have the intention of doing what the church does, therefore uh, they, they, there was no correct ministerial intention. Now, Anglicans can demonstrate with perfect accuracy that there have been and are Anglican bishops who both believe what the Catholic Church believes and intend to do what the Catholic Church does when they, use, when they ordain someone. Therefore, they have the correct ministerial intention. But this has absolutely no bearing on the validity of their right by reason of its defective form. Uh, a very famous French theologian, a father de la Taille, was a Jesuit. He, he's, he makes this clear that in the making or confection of a sacrament, the ministerial intention is concerned only with the application of a form complete in itself to matter which is of itself sufficient. One thing he goes on to say, one thing, however, the ministerial intention can never do, it can never confer on the form a signification the form itself does not possess. In other words, should the signification of the form be in any way deficient, the intention of the minister would not supply this deficiency. So that is to say that a defective sacramental right can never be used to confect a sacrament, even when used by a lawful minister with a correct intention. So if a Catholic bishop use the Anglican rite with the intention of, conf uh, uh, of ordaining a Catholic priest, still nothing would happen, because he's, he's got the correct ministerial intention, but the form of, of, of the uh, rite of ordination is in itself invalid. But the question of ministerial intention is, is only incidental anyway to Pope Leo's case, because the defect of form is sufficient anyway to render the Anglican rite invalid. All that the Pope is doing is to point out that when Queen Elizabeth I instituted her new Protestant hierarchy with the consecration of Matthew Parker as Archbishop of Canterbury in 1559, the reintroduction of the Cranerian Ordinal with its pronounced anti sacerdotal signification in place of the Serum Pontifical, which had been restored under Queen Mary, manifested an in external intention incompatible with the conferring of the Catholic sacrament. So you see, that was conclusive. Queen Mary brought back the Catholic uh, pontifical. Then Elizabeth threw it out and went back to Cranmer's uh, ordinal. Apologies for the validity of Anglican orders. They've made uh, very much of a slight revisions made in this ordinal in 1662. Uh, these were the words uh, for the office and work of a priest in the Church of God now committed under thee by the imposition of our hands. <laughs> Now, these words were added to the indeterminate form of the 1552 ordinal. So, the complete 1552 form reads as follows. Receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins thou dost forgive thee are forgiven, and whose sins thou dost retain thee are retained, and be thou a faithful dispenser of the word of God and of his holy sacraments, and the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, you'll notice that the word priest doesn't occur in this form. And... Uh, at all. That, by the way, that's the 1552 form. Now I'm going to give you uh, the complete 1662 form with the added words that I just mentioned to you. Receive the Holy Ghost for the office and work of a priest in the Church of God, now committed unto thee by the imposition of our hands. You know, see, if those words were used in a Catholic rite, then it could be considered as a, as a valid form. Uh, so I'll start it again. Receive the Holy Ghost for the office and work of a priest in the church of God now committed unto thee by the imposition of our hands. Whose sins thou dost forgive thee are forgiven, and whose sins thou dost retain thee are retained, and be thou a faithful dispenser of the word of God and of his holy sacraments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
So it will be noted that even with this addition, it's simply a case of an office being committed to the ordinance, and the assistance of the Holy Ghost is invoked to help and fulfill it worthily. There is no suggestion here or anywhere else in the rite as revived in, as revised in 1662 that new powers which the ordinance did not possess before have been conformed upon him. Committed is not a sacramental word. Uh, it says, the, 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 for the office and work of a priest in the church of God, now committed unto thee. And as I just said, committed is not a sacramental wor- word. The church does not commit sacraments, she confers them. Pope Leo XIII took the 1662 changes into consideration, but ruled they could not be considered as imparting validity to a right which never had been valid. And he says, any words in the Anglican ordinal, as it now is, which lend themselves to ambiguity, cannot be taken in the same sense as they possess in the Catholic rite. For once a new rite has been initiated, in which, as we have seen, the sacrament of order is adulterated or denied, and from which all idea of consecration and sacrifice has been rejected, the formula, receive the Holy Ghost, no longer holds good, because the Spirit is infused into the soul with the grace of the sacrament, and so the words, for the office and work of a priest or bishop, and the like, no longer hold good, but remain as words without the reality which Christ instituted. A factor which has considerable bearing on the question of the validity of Anglican orders is the attitude of the Orthodox Church. You'll be glad to know I'm almost at the end now. Uh, Writing in 1898, Cardinal Vaughan remarked, Another point which, in my opinion, ought to be dwelt upon in discussing with Anglicans the question of their orders is this. They stand absolutely alone and isolated from both Western and Eastern Christianity. Leo XIII, in his condemnation of the validity of their orders, condemned them on grounds which are common to us with the Russian, the Greek, and all the great Eastern communions. We Catholics differ from these various communions upon certain specific doctrines, but upon others we remain in perfect agreement. Among the points of agreement are the sacramental doctrines, and notably the doctrines of the objective real presence, the priesthood, and the sacrifice of the Mass. Here we are all at one to the exclusion of Anglicanism. And no honest handling of the Anglican Ordinal of 1552, no honest interpretation of the language used by Cranner and his colleagues concerning the real presence, the priesthood and the mass, no honest explanation of the destruction of altars and of the substitution for them of tables in all the churches that were in England, wrested from the jurisdiction of the Holy See, can bring the Anglican body into line with the Catholic Church and Eastern Communions. And it should also be noted that an attempt by the Church of England to have its orders recognized by the Pan-Orthodox Conference in 1948 was rejected in no uncertain terms. The reply from the Orthodox reads as follows. The teaching of faith contained in the 39 articles of the Anglican Church definitely differs from the dogmas, faith, and tradition confessed by the Orthodox Church. Therefore, if the Orthodox Church cannot agree to recognize the rightness of the Anglican teaching on the sacraments in general, and of the sacrament of order in particular, neither can she recognize Anglican orders as valid. The fact that old Catholic bishops have taken part in Anglican ordinations has got no bearing whatsoever on the validity of the orders received if the Anglican ordinal was used. As should have been made sufficiently clear already, even an authorized minister with a correct intention cannot confer a sacrament validly by using an invalid rite. (coughs) Hence, valid orders would not have been conferred even in such cases as the participation in the consecration of George Montaigne as the Bishop of Lincoln on the 14th of December, 1607, by Marco Antonio de Dominis, the apostate Bishop of Spalato, which is split into Armatia. It's my, where my wife comes from, actually. It's <laughs> the only person anybody's ever heard of from Split is this apostate bishop. So there must be some sort of message there somewhere. Huh? So he took part in Anglican ordination, but even though he was a valid ordained Catholic bishop, the, the orders he gave weren't valid. I've already quoted Pope Leo the uh, Thirteenth to uh, with his comments on the uh, 1662 editions, and he says. Any words in the Anglican ordinal, as it now is, which lend themselves to ambiguity, cannot be taken in the same sense as they possess in the Catholic rite. Because this is a point of crucial importance. 
Because if the additions made in 1662 had made the Anglican rite adequate, then when it was used by bishops with valid orders, such as the old Catholics, uh, who took part in Anglican ordinations in 1932, 1933, 1947, then the sacrament would have been conferred validly. But the judgment of Pope Leo XIII, which is irrevocable, is that we pronounce and declare that ordinations carried out according to the Anglican rite have been and are absolutely null and utterly void. To sum up, this must be beautiful words for you to hear, but I'm going to sum up then. To sum up, the defective sacramental signification of the Anglican ordinal derives not from any explicit rejection of the sacrificing priesthood, but from a rejection which, though implicit, is unmistakable. This is proved by the composition of an ordination rite which, although retaining some traditional features, rejected everything from the pre-Reformation rite which clearly expressed the essential consecrating and sacrificial function of the Catholic priesthood. The outstanding Catholic historians of the English Reformation all lay special emphasis on Cranmer's technique of introducing doctrinal innovation through the liturgy, not by explicit heresy, but by the omission of prayers and ceremonies which could not be re reconciled with Protestant belief. Their judgment on such omissions is unanimous. Uh, this is a key point, that what is not affirmed is considered to be denied. This was a key point in the vindication of the Bull Apostolic Curie, which was made by the English Catholic bishops when the Anglican bishops had... Uh, published a letter attacking Apostolic Curie. This is what the Catholic bishops said. They warned against omitting or reforming, and I quote, anything in those forms which immemorial tradition has bequeathed to us. For such an immemorial usage, whether or not it has in the course of ages incorporated superfluous accretions, must, in the estimation of those who believe in a divinely guarded visible church, at least have retained whatever is necessary so that, in adhering rigidly to the right handed down to us, we can always feel secure. Whereas, if we omit or change anything, we may perhaps be abandoning just that element which is essential. And this sound method is that which the Catholic Church has always followed. That in earlier times, local churches were permitted to add new prayers and ceremonies is acknowledged, but that they were also permitted to subtract prayers and ceremonies in previous use and even to remodel the existing rites in the most drastic manner is a proposition of which we know of no historical foundation and which it appears to us is absolutely incredible. There is not the least doubt that the decision made by Pope Leo XIII is irrevocable. In November of 1896, he sent a letter to Cardinal Richard of Paris to make clear precisely the authority carried by his bull, because some of these liberal French priests at the time were saying, well, it's not necessarily the final word. And this is what the Pope said to Cardinal Richard. It was our intention thereby to deliver a final judgment and to settle absolutely that most grave question about Anglican orders, which indeed was long since lawfully defined by our predecessors, but by our indulgence was entirely reheard. And this we did with such weight of argument and in such clear and authoritative tones that no prudent or right-minded man could possibly doubt what our judgment was, and so all Catholics were bound to receive it with the utmost respect as being finally settled and determined without possible appeals. And today, probably every bishop in the English-speaking world uh, says, oh, it didn't settle the matter and it, you know, it should be opened again. The most frequent argument cited by those wishing to question the binding authority of the ball is that it is not infallible. An infallible pronouncement in the strictest sense of the word pertains only to what is contained in the deposit of revelation, which is known as the primary object of infallibility. It is evident that our Lord gave us no revelation as to the validity or invalidity of Anglican orders. But there is a secondary object of infallibility, which involves truths connected with revelation, uh, including historical facts. Now, it's an infallibly revealed truth that our Lord instituted a sacrificing priesthood, but it is absolutely essential for the faithful to know his or who is, not, who is, or who is not a priest. Uh, when a convert priest celebrates his Mass, his congregation has the right to know that his Mass is valid. Thus, 
When the Church pronounces upon the validity of the ordinations of any Christian communion, we can know with infallible certainty that its decision is true. Convert priests from orthodoxy are accepted without reordination because the Church accepts the validity of their orders and then we need have no scruple about attending their masses even though they haven't gone to a, a Catholic rite of ordination. Uh, decisions relating to this secondary area of infallibility are what is known as dogmatic facts. An apostolic curie comes into this category and uh, dogmatic facts are also infallible. So, the, uh, although in itself it was an infallible statement, the doctrine contained is it is infallible uh, because it constitutes what, what is known as a dogmatic fact. So there is no possibility that Leo XIII was mistaken, and there is no possibility that his decision will ever be reversed. The verdict of the bull is not simply final, but the verdict is infallible. Oh. Thank you for listening so patiently. If, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you did find that very hard to understand, actually, I've got a book on the subject called, uh, what's it called? Uh, oh, the Order of Melchizedek. And it's got the whole story. It's also got about the new rite of Catholic ordination, which has also had every single prayer ref referring to sacrifice removed. In fact, it's actually worse than... <laughs> Is ordinal, but that's another story. Uh, again, just, uh,